Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Jillian. Uh, welcome to everyone to our Steichman Visiting Professor Lecture. Uh, Steichman Visiting Professor Day is a long-standing legacy at, uh, at McGill in the cardiothoracic uh, division. Um, this is uh, currently in something like its 55th or 56th iteration. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge once again and thank uh, uh, for the um, uh, outstanding, uh, truly uh, remarkable support from the Steichman family, without which uh, this event would never have started and wouldn't have uh, been what it is today. Uh, on Steichman Visiting Professor Day, we uh, acknowledge uh, our, um, our outstanding, the outstanding work done by our multidisciplinary team members in taking care of our increasingly complex uh, patients. Uh, we, also, uh, we also recognize our graduating uh, residents. Uh, so this year we have uh, Dr. Khalid De Ridwan and Dr. Rick Tang, uh, who uh, will be graduating from our training program and who have uh, uh, both uh, evolved and matured into uh, outstanding uh, surgeons. And we also welcome a visiting professor. So as Jillian alluded, uh, this year uh, we were obliged to uh, conduct this in a virtual fashion, um, but we are extremely, extremely grateful to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Eric Roselli. Dr. Roselli is a cardiac surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I would say at the height of, uh, of, uh, of notoriety um, in the areas of aortic surgery, uh, valvular surgery, uh, minimally invasive approaches uh, to cardiac surgery, um, as well as catheter-based and uh, hybrid approaches. So truly an innovator uh, with uh, something like uh, 250 publications and book chapters um, uh, has uh, really taken our specialty to uh, the highest, uh, highest levels. Um, so I'm very, very enthusiastic uh, to have uh, to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Roselli in a virtual fashion as a visiting, as a Steichman visiting uh, professor lecturer. Uh, furthermore, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Roselli for agreeing uh, to join us next year uh, for Steichman visiting professor day in its full in-person tradition. And uh, so we are thrilled to be able to welcome Dr. Roselli twice. I suppose that merits an asterisk next to the Steichman list of visiting professors. And so uh, without further ado, Dr. Roselli, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I really look forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chechede. And thank you to the Steichman family for allowing me this opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope at the end of the talk, you don't sort of renege on the invitation for next year. But I but uh, but I also tell every all my students and my kids even don't ever apologize when you're given a lecture and see what I just did. Um, I I think this is going to be really fun and and we'll have some time afterward uh, to chat and have and and hopefully take some questions. I'm going to share my screen now and um, and deliver uh, my lecture on the topic. of comprehensive, lifelong, expeditious aortic care at the cutting edge. Can everybody see this okay? Yes. Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, disclosures are shown in this slide. I will be speaking about some off-label and investigational use of devices. Uh, I've, um, I really consider my relationship with a lot of these industry partners important to my development and learning about what we do if we're gonna embrace new technologies, uh, there's a, a broad amount of knowledge available from the research and development teams who, um, um, they are businesses, uh, they're in the business of helping us help patients. And so we should help to be there to guide them. The focus of most of my work has been aortic disease. And I think we need to appreciate that it's an underappreciated epidemic. Uh, two of my colleagues, Lars Fenson and Rene Rodriguez, did an analysis of some CDC data and, uh, and other um, uh, databases several years ago and estimated that over 40,000 people may die a year from aortic disease. Uh, and that's equivalent to what we see with regards to the number of deaths from a whole lot of common causes listed below, like some of the cancers you see listed. And so it's been gaining attention. 
We certainly see that it's changed our practice over the years. And in 2021, aortic surgery represented one in five of the operations that we do within our group. And you can see uh, it's been steadily rising over the years and consistently over 1,200 operations. And in 2021, we did 1,441 aortic repairs of all different kinds. So how will we be treating the thoracic aorta in the near future? Definitely more commonly, and that's a good thing as awareness increases around this disease. And part of this has come about uh, because of an organizational realignment that occurred here in Cleveland about 15 years ago when Dr. Toby Cosgrove took over as the CEO and the president of the hospital. We switched from a typical model where you have this uh, uh, conventional division between surgery and medicine uh, I don't know why that got stuck, to a more radical model based on disease and organ-based institutes. So we became the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute, which made, is made up of the de departments of cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology, and vascular surgery, which allowed us to, to collaborate even better than I think we already were doing. And as uh, Dr. Cosgrove said, those older models were built for the convenience of the doctors. This institute model is built for the convenience of patients and families. We need to come around uh, together from the different disciplines that we have to share our leadership, to develop this partnership. And then within each of these institute models, we have centers, centers of excellence, uh, centers of focus. And so we have an aorta center, which initially I was given the, the lead of in uh, um, 2008, 2009, I believe. And and what I did right away is said, this isn't, uh, this isn't something that, that I should be running alone. We need to create multiple center, multiple leaders around the center that represent each of the disciplines so our voices are equally shared. And, uh, and we built this and we've used this model to develop a whole bunch of centers of excellence across the whole HVTI. Uh, and it's been fun to see that grow where someone has an idea about what they can do better for an individual patient they can bring a team together pretty quickly. We did that early on when we were looking at how we could expand and improve this interaction about how we manage our patients over a lifetime uh, in aortic disease management. And it really started with those acute aortic syndromes. So many patients come to us in an emergency situation, many of them with really no medical care at all. And then all of a sudden they have this life-changing event, we save their life. And, uh, and realize that they need us to help them maintain their life afterward. And so uh, this acute aortic syndrome is sort of led by the interventional and surgical groups. Uh, we see a lot of these patients then go on to develop advanced stage disease because we've developed follow-up protocols for them. Uh, and uh, of course, we learn that when you have a family member that's, that has aortic disease, it's important to screen other family members. We often find early or moderate disease in those patients, and we find moderate and early disease in other ways throughout our system that we've built. And our medical team from cardiology has embraced sort of that element uh, of building this whole area of how we grow our aortic program and all those, uh, those sort of buckets of patients, so to speak, feed into one another. So how do we treat aortic disease now? Together. I think we are, we are like special forces here in these smaller teams that can focus on one mission at a time. And it's important to do that because aortic disease is life-threatening. Certainly aneurysms uh, can rupture or they can dissect like you see the one on the right. But our only treatment right now is prophylactic replacement of that disease segment of the aorta. And like I tell my patients when we're sort of planning when to fix an aneurysm, the best time would really be the day before it ruptures pretty far from that ideal goal, but I think uh, um, we'll be learning a lot more about this pathology process as we've built, as we've built focus teams around understanding it from very, diff very different uh, perspectives. The natural history of the ascending aorta suggests that we should intervene at five and a half centimeters or less, and I'm always embarrassed when I show this kind of curves that we've decided this upon because it's not even a curve, it's just a handful of data points you know, with this, with this jagged line, my, my elementary school or my kids when they were in elementary school probably would have laughed at this if I called it a curve. 
And it's true that size isn't a very good predictor, even though it's still the mainstay of how we decide what to do. You see from this IRAD data that nearly 60% of patients less than that cutoff are showing up with acute aortic syndromes. So we need to do better. We tried to understand kind of how to estimate the natural history, uh, taking into account some of the, some of the uh, personal elements of a patient, such as the patient's body size. And we never felt that body surface area made a whole lot of sense, certainly because we see a lot of obese people here in, in our section of the country. And by a, a BSA formula, if you gained weight, it would reduce your risk. So we focused on height. Uh, Lars Svensson sort of uh, uh, first started this with a couple of small studies. And then uh, Melinda Sai and our group from cardiology, who's embraced the aortic disease as an area of specialty in cardiology, have looked closer at larger uh, volumes of data and found that that is a, a, a really nice, actually, uh, predictor, the use of this aortic uh, area at a height ratio. And we even uh, have differentiated the, the, some of these phenotypic findings. You see the image on the left. When the roots dilated, there may be higher risk situation. So we're starting to understand that we can correlate the size to the patient's size and also the shape of that patient's aorta or the pattern of their disease. And this has been validated by the group from Yale who first sort of looked at that database um, uh, that gave us some of those guidelines early on. John Aleftariades has done a lot of this work, but they also have confirmed that height is even better than body surface area uh, and validates this Svensson index idea of thinking. The problem with looking just at aortic diameter as a predictor of risk is that it's sort of a, a dependent on this idea of the law of Laplace, where we look at diameter and wall thickness and pressure as, as important inputs to that. However, uh, it's quite an oversimplification, and I don't mean any disrespect to, to Sir Laplace, uh, his description of how man-made materials with known properties uh, certainly makes a lot of sense, but vascular tissue behaves in a nonlinear anisotropic way. It changes uh, over time and, and these biologic structures act a lot different uh, than a man-made structure. We know that there's a lot of wall shear stress and altered flows in different states. Uh, the nice Linear flow pattern you see on the left is a normal pattern of flow through a tricuspid valve without a dilated aorta. And then the other uh, patterns you see are different versions of flow and stress on the walls in patients with various phenotypes of bicuspid aortic valves. The images on the right are in a patient with aortic stenosis, and you see there's even more varied wall stress. Uh, it, it's exacerbated by, exacerbated by the presence of that aortic stenosis. And so as we're learning what happens in the aortic wall, where there's this process of, of what should be maintenance, maintenance of the integrity of that aortic wall over a lifetime, uh, it's, it's progressively damaged due to this process of maladaptive remodeling. So you have altered stresses on the wall uh, and the, the, the processes in the media that maintain that structure change in a maladaptive way over time. We study the aorta biomechanics in, in my lab. I have a biomedical engineering lab, and we've created this, uh, what I call the Matadors project or Matador study. We got partners from industry because they're interested in things like the compliance of these tissues when they're developing new devices. And uh, we study both the in vivo and ex vivo behavior of these tissues, including histologic assessments. And uh, uh, not just with uni uh, uniaxial load testing, like you see in that video in the middle, but biaxial load testing as well. The in vivo biomechanics are gathered from epi aortic ultrasound. We can quickly do that on all of our patients as part of the standard of care uh, and assess that tissue while the heparin is circulating. And you can see um, we not only look at the epi aortic, but we look at TE data, we do speckle tracking and understand what's happening in the walls of the tissue. And then we extract these aortas. And I take an extra couple minutes when I take an aorta out, uh, for example, in this patient who has both an ascending and an aortic root aneurysm, we carefully try to keep that whole uh, bit of aorta intact and get it to the lab this way. And then we later separate it out, as you see on the upper right, where we'll take specimens uh, in that dog bone fashion for that uniaxial load testing and then square segments 
for the biaxial load testing that's done on the tissue. Uh, other segments are taken near where the specimens are for the histology slides so we can correlate them. Uh, we also have uh, these specimens go into uh, under fluid and imaging process. And then the biaxial load testing, after we just put some speckles on there, allows us to gather some further data about how these tissues behave. And, uh, and we've got a massive amount of data on all of these specimens. We now have over 250 patients enrolled in this Matadors uh, project uh, with all uh, different presentations of disease, uh, different valve patterns, uh, known hereditary conditions, and acute dissections. And what we've learned from some of these analyses is that age and region of the aorta seems to be more important than other factors that we've considered important, like the presence of a bicuspid valve or connective tissue disorder. Uh, over time, the construct of the media of your vessel wall changes. You lose elastin and you lose that elastic energy over time. And you can see the different shades of blue in the middle represent the different segments of the aorta between the non-coronary sinus root specimen and the proximal and distal aorta. And that will be relevant as we develop devices, certainly over time. Uh, and this factor about age, I think is critical for us to consider. I showed you how we think about a patient's height, and we think about the pattern of disease. We also need to correlate age and maybe measure measurements, uh, uh, imaging measurements of stiffness in patients. In this study, also from our labs recently presented and, and just uh, accepted for publication, uh, we looked at these echocardiographic biomechanics and looked at uh, predictors of failure strain. It wasn't surprising that age was by far the strongest uh, most important variable, but some of the other more important variables uh, uh, taken from echocardiographic data were also important. Once again, in this study, uh, similar to the other study that I showed briefly, we found there was sort of an inflection point around 55 years of age where the stiffness of our aorta seems to change over time. Uh, but even looking at the echo biomechanics data, when, when uh, we looked at things like dispensability and stiffness index, they correlated pretty well with some of these diameter uh, um, correlations with, uh, with the stiffness of, and failure strain of these aortas. We're also learning that thoracic aortic disease is more commonly familial. It used to be we just recognized a few clinical syndromes like uh, Marfan's and, and Turner's and Ehlers Danlos. Uh, Lois Dietz is a more recent sort of discovery that for the longest time we called those patients Marfanoid. Uh, but now we're real, realizing that what is happening in a lot of these patients is that they are having abnormalities of these maintenance proteins uh, that are coded uh, to maintain the integrity of the elastin contractile unit. And so we found genetically triggered association with several other uh, proteins in that space. Uh, and now we screen for when we get a panel of genes about 35 different genes that, that we know are associated with aortic aneurysm disease and our knowledge is really growing rapidly in that space and should continue to do so. Uh, we're also learning that it's pretty consistent from a histologic basis about what happens in these aortic walls. We saw it in acute dissections and we saw it in aneurysms and it seemed uh, to be very similar sort of processes happening in that media layer. And these were all validated in a Marfan mouse model, uh, where we also found that uh, there was reduced Adam TS5 activity. But you can see a normal uh, 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 media layer with the lamina uh, all in a nice ordered configuration. And then you see the image on the right where it's all disordered. And there's a massive amount of accumulation of this proteoglycan in between these spaces, which disrupts those connections as it builds up over time. We did mass spectroscopy on this and found that agrican and versican were two of the proteoglycans that actually accumulated in really massive amounts in all of these different patients. Uh, we also, interesting and, and a little different than what Law of Laplace would tell us, in one of the studies found that the thicker tissue was weaker. And it's, that suggested the accumulation of these proteoglycans in that media space. Interestingly, uh, a group from Germany uh, found that uh, agrican may serve as a new biomarker 
for patients with acute aortic syndrome. And we're looking to validate some of these uh, studies as well, looking to use uh, this as a potential new biomarker, might help us in decision-making in patients with intramural hematoma. We're also looking at ways to image this with high resolution MRI. And so we're gaining a, a lot of knowledge that may translate pretty quickly in the clinical practice in a short period of time. So when will we be treating the aorta in the near future? Well, we'll probably be treating it sooner as we understand more about its behavior and sort of more and, and definitely more precisely tailored to each individual patient. And now let's talk a little bit about how we treat the aorta and what's happening. We know that the extent of disease affects the complexity of repair as we think about the aorta in all of its segments from the proximal to the distal portions of the aorta. You add dissection to the mix and it, and it increases the complexity of what we do in the operating room. Well, our elective uh, mortality for thoracic aortic surgery has been maintained at a really low level, one third uh, on a pretty consistent basis even compared to a university health system consortium uh, comparisons. Uh, and again, I think that's due to the teamwork and, uh, and, and the large volume that what we do. Certainly still the most common operation that we'll do in the thoracic aorta is an ascending aortic repair. Uh, often looks something like this. You, many of you are familiar with that. We've shown that we can do that really safely, even in multi-component operations. In isolated ascending replacements, our mortality is about one half of 1%. In multi-component operations and mortality is 2%, uh, often predicted by the other comorbid conditions like coronary disease. In another study, we tried to ask the question, well, all right, when we see these patients undergoing these multi-component operations, can we parse out the group where the cardiac indication was the primary indication to ask this question, do we add any risk when we add an aortic replacement to a patient where it may be a prophylactic or more prophylactic kind of measure. And interestingly, we've, we found when we, we were able to match them across a comparison group from 12,000 cardiac patients, uh, we found that there was no difference in mortality or stroke rates. And you can see both of those are really low, less than 1% on the mortality level and a very low stroke rates as well. We can handle some of these in a minimally invasive way. Uh, we certainly still do most of our isolated aortic valves with a smaller incision, and we can address ascending aorta that way as well, including total root replacements as, uh, uh, and uh, valve plus root. The, the proximal aorta, however, has uh, different features and different functions and different behaviors and is affected by diseases differently. And it's no surprise because we see embryologic variability as we move our way through the aorta. The root needs to be given uh, extra attention because of the complexity due to the valve and the coronaries. And there's generally about four different ways to handle this. Uh, everything from mechanical composite valve graft to homographs and valve preserving root procedures. Uh, but those, these are more complex. And uh, there seems to be a volume to outcome relationship. Uh, certainly there was in this study that was uh, done, uh, published in 13, but data taken over over a decade ago showed that about 25% of these operations on the aortic root or ABR plus ascendings were performed at 3% of the centers. And that impacted outcome. We saw the lowest volume centers, the mortality was highest at 6%, higher volume centers with greater than 30 cases, the mortality was cut in half. And those centers had more endocarditis. Well, at an even higher volume center, like ours, we did over 500 root replacements in 2021. These different variations of how to handle the aortic root. Our root replacement mortality was exceptionally low. Again, a half a percent for elective operations and less than 10% in emergency situations. Most of those are acute dissections. And that compares very favorably uh, with uh, STS uh, database uh, publication that was a little more recent than the other one I showed you with elective uh, mortality of 2.7%. This is particularly important as we see our surgical patients, our patients referred for surgery in the era of TAVR, our patients with bicuspid aortic valves. We know that about uh, 40, maybe even 50% of patients with bicuspid valves will have aortic disease and they need surgery. Thank goodness, because sometimes these aortic valves look like this and I would hate for someone to try to put a TAVR device inside one of these aortic valves. It's just not gonna work, especially this one. 
even in the operating room, I had a hard time finding the orifice across this valve uh, that had previously been repaired 18 years earlier. Once we debrided some of that calcium, we found this opening, which I still can't believe the patient was even alive with this. The question that arises when we do operate on these aortic uh, bicuspid aortic valves, what do we do about the ascending aorta? We saw from uh, Michael Borger and the group from Toronto many years ago that if you leave a four and a half centimeter aorta behind, uh, you're going to see a, a, a large percentage of these patients are going to have aortic complications within a relatively short period of time, within the first decade or so. And, and I was surprised then to see the same group publish this paper that says the aortic root does not dilate over time after replacement. I have problems with this study. If you look at the images on the left, where they talk about the aortic root dimensions being stable over time, the follow-up is only five or six years. That was, the, that was the mean imaging time, five and a half years. And yet when they described what happened to these aortas, the patients who needed an operation, none of them sort of had those changes in time until about eight years. And so to make a decision like this, or to make a statement like this, such a bold statement like this, we really need to follow these patients beyond that first decade of care and into the second decade. And most of our patients with bicuspid aortic valves that come to us for surgery are gonna live into that second decade. So I disagree with those conclusions completely. And here's some examples. This is a 55 year old lawyer with bicuspid valve severe stenosis, kind of mixed valve disease, modern AI, was referred to Toby Cosgrove, who by the way, was a 25th Steichman professor. Uh, he did this operation in 2002. There was no CT, but he left um, this mildly dilated root behind, at least uh, by echo, it was 43 millimeters, did a mini sternotomy, replaced the valve with a 27 millimeter mechanical valve, said the ascending aorta looked okay and, uh, and planned to uh, hopefully have a lifetime treatment for that patient. Well, 17 years later, this patient came back to Cleveland because someone scanned him for some reason and found that his root is now five and a half centimeters with a really high ratio. Uh, guy's still a healthy 72 year old. This is going to be a common story, I think. And so we need to keep track of these patients with a history of bicuspid aortic valve, especially if you're building an aortic program, I think you need to make sure that you understand that that population of patients uh, is going to have some changes in the second decade of their lives. This is another patient, 46 year old, in 2004, underwent an AVR with a subcoronary sentence bioprosthesis, then developed severe AI in 2013. Uh, these are the images uh, that, were, that were taken, uh, show that the root was four and a half centimeters. This patient went to another hospital for their uh, redo valve replacement, and at that uh, institution just had a stented bioprosthesis put in, in this 55-year-old patient. And lo and behold, five years later, uh, now only 15 years from that initial ABR was found at the age of 60 to have a five and a half centimeter aorta, which, which actually grew quite fast. And so we reoperated on this patient as well. These are just examples, but there's many like them that demonstrate that the root does grow and the patients often do live 10 and 20 years after an aortic valve replacement. So we need to change our perspective to a lifelong view for these patients. And so when we make decisions, we need to tailor it and have a shared decision-making uh, process with those patients as well, understanding not only what's going on with their aorta and their aortic valve, uh, but what their age and prognosis uh, plays with regards to what their lifelong durability will be. Uh, and we need to look internally at our own surgical results, understand our own experience with complex techniques like repair and some of the advanced techniques like endovascular uh, strategies or hybrid strategies, and really listen to our patients to understand what their preference is. Many patients want to avoid anticoagulation. In fact, in our center, it seems like the majority of patients want to avoid anticoagulation and will choose another reoperation down the road, especially now that we see TAVR valve and valve uh, as an option. They often ask about minimally invasive approaches uh, and we'll choose them if, if, and, uh, and we'll provide that opportunity if we think there's equipoise in the safety. Some set of patients that have aortic root disease uh, requires a little more detail, a little more attention to detail. We need to appreciate that the aortic valve isn't just the moving components of that valve. It's really the entire commissures, leaflets, annulus, sinuses, and sinotubular junction that determines how a valve functions uh, and is a living structure. 
we will commonly do David reimplantations for these patients. It's a great way to save the, the function of that, uh, that construct. Uh, we published this data a few years ago. Uh, certainly in patients with connective tissue disorders, we showed that we could do these operations really safely uh, and they're very durable. And we have uh, further data that shows good durability even up to 20 years with this kind of approach. And so our volume doing these operations has expanded. Now we have several surgeons who do these operations quite regularly. Um, uh, I'll even do these operations now because we can do it uh, so consistently and safely in older patients if their valves look really great and in patients with more complex presentations like patients with severely uh, leaking valves, like this 21 year old who had clearly very severe AI at dilated uh, left ventricle and annulus. Um, we did a David reimplantation and we had this really nice image afterward with good coaptation. Uh, we tightened up the annulus and normalized the aortic root structure. Hopefully that'll prove to be durable. Uh, and so we, you see that in our experience now, we're consistently doing over 120 of these operations a year. A large proportion of them are patients with bicuspid valves as we've, we've appreciated the importance of that root dilatation and what it means long-term in those patients. And here's the way we do uh, a David's procedure in a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. So we've now um, resected the aorta, mobilized the coronary arteries. We'll trim away some of this uh, rafe or this area, really a malformed commissure where there's some fibrosis. We've assessed the leaflets and it feels like it's a very mobile leaflet. We see how those edges should line up after we do a little bit of uh, reconstruction. Huge annulus admits a, a 30 millimeter Hagar dilator with ease. I'll place a few more of these subannular sutures in one of these really dilated annuluses. Uh, typically, I put six in a tricuspid valve and eight in a bicuspid valve. It's not very dilated, but in this patient, we had a very dilated annulus. We'll put even more of those sutures in. We mark our graft. So we've got this more 180 to 180 kind of configuration. We know that symmetric cusps will act better. Uh, than asymmetry. And so after we trim this graft up, we go ahead and place those sutures from the subannular position across the base of that graft and tie it down over a Hagar dilator to reduce the annulus, but not reduce it too much. And then we re-implant the valve very carefully uh, inside the valve and I'll either do it with stitches inside or in and out stitches like this. And once we've got that valve re-implanted, then I go ahead and do the cusp repair. Then you can see in this cusp, those edges line up really nicely. So we decided all we needed here was a plication of the central portion of this valve. Take a, a small suture, um, uh, either a 5-0 uh, braided suture like you see here, or a 6-0 proline suture. And we run that, uh, run that area closed and, then, and, and close that whole belly of that leaflet. And it looks something like this with a nice symmetric repair with healthy looking cusps. We've, we've expanded this sort of understanding about the importance of all those different components of the aortic root to even uh, extend into some of our patients where a ROS operation is indicated. Uh, we will add an annuloplasty if that annulus isn't too dilated. I don't like to do a ROS if it's really dilated like the 30 millimeter annulus we saw, but if it's uh, up to between 25 and 28 millimeters, I'll reduce the annulus. With an annuloplasty ring, I use a, a mitral uh, annuloplasty ring to do that with subannular sutures, and then we, we drop our Ross uh, autographs in there. Sometimes, though, the annulus is just too big, and you need to replace the valve, and it's fine. This patient has a 40 millimeter annulus. Despite all these efforts to prevent death in these patients by doing these, these really great root operations, we still see de novo dissection occurs in our patients, uh, especially those with known connective tissue disorders. Um, and it's no surprise then that many of our patients who have aortic disease present an emergency situation. It's at least one in five of the over thousand thoracic aortic operations we did last year. And a lot of these patients are walking around with aortic disease and don't realize it. That's why they show up in an emergency. Just like I showed you with aortic root surgery, experience matters with regards to outcomes for acute aortic syndromes. That's been shown in the US data and UK data. Interestingly, they call a large volume center one that does over five to 10 operations a year. We're doing about 75 a year. 
And we demonstrated, at least in this uh, subset analysis of about 400 uh, patients, uh, that we had really great outcomes when we looked at all comers with type A and type B dissection, except the type A dissection patients that we turned down. We need to appreciate that there are multiple ha hazard phases, not just acute and chronic. We need to understand and differentiate the hyperacute patient from the acute patient when they present uh, because the hyperacute patient that's in trouble really needs this multidisciplinary team to come together quickly uh, and do all of their different uh, roles to take care of these patients. We've developed this acute aortic disease network. The reach of our helicopters is about a 200 mile radius and we have many referring centers, nearly a, nearly a, a, a thousand hospitals, uh, some of whom may get a dissection once every couple of years, but they're tied in with our team where we can share the imaging and get those images. So if I'm woken up at 3 a.m., I can look at the CAT scan before I even get to the hospital and give the team a sense of what we might be doing in that operation because these operations are becoming more complex as our options have expanded. Certainly, we still will offer patients a conventional limited reconstruction, certainly for the bakey type 2 diseases, uh, sometimes something more complex in the root, like a, like a valve reimplantation Davis procedure for a young patient who's stable. Um, but what we know about this limited sort of repair uh, is that it doesn't always take care of all the problems. Certainly, that may be true in patients who present with, more, uh, with ischemia, because we know that this ischemic presentation increases a patient's risk. And interestingly, when we did a comparison, uh, this is a paper hopefully we'll be presenting and publishing very soon. We did a comparison of those who underwent limited versus extended repairs. Our patients who underwent a frozen elephant trunk with our novel technique actually had a significant reduction in acute kidney injury as we were able to perfuse those aortas better downstream. We think that's probably going to have an impact long-term as well, because we know if there's a patent lumen downstream, it affects survival and it affects reoperation rates, which begs the question, is fixing the ascending aorta with the limited repair really good enough in 2022? Well, we do have some of these two te new technologies. Uh, the uh, Thoraflex device just became approved last week in the US. We don't even have it on the shelves yet, but we have some of these technologies with multiple branches sewn in. They really help to improve uh, some of the distal anastomoses but most of these technologies still require we do a lot of anastomoses, which increases time and increases neurologic risk. So there's really been limited adoption of this even in Europe and other countries. For the longest time, we were working on trying to make a more simplified technique. This started with a patient who first showed up with a retrograde dissection and I sewed into the stent graft and then realized we can do this better. And over a period of several years, our technique expanded to what we call the branch stent and anastomosis <laughs> elephant trunk repair which has become our standardized kind of operation for this. I published this sort of evolution of the procedure in March of 2018. And no surprise, uh, as this has become our sort of standard approach to a lot of patients, we do over 130 elephant trunks a year. I got this letter a couple months later, not even a couple months, maybe six months, six weeks later from the FDA that <laughs> it was nice of them to say that they hoped I was well, uh, and then they recommended that I collaborate with them to study these patients in an IDE because I was using uh, a device in an off-label way. So uh, I embraced that, and I know the team from the FDA, and we have been talking about that, and we started to put together a physician-sponsored IDE to study our results. The challenge for putting the study together was to be all-inclusive. We're not looking to approve a device for a company where you have limited inclusion exclusion criteria and kind of a sweet subset of patients that to, to demonstrate safety. We wanted to study this, publish our results, and gather the data about all the patients that we see. And so we know that patients with thoracic aortic disease, multi-segment disease, are a diverse group of patients with everything from acute aortic dissection to, to degenerative aneurysms and even conge uh, congenital problems like Comal's diverticulum or post coarc aneurysms. And uh, we do these operations using a multiple different strategies with either hand-sewn branches or stented branches along the way. Uh, what we do is deliver a stent graft into the aorta, cut a hole and deliver a branch into the arch branch vessels. I shared with them some of my early unpublished results to get this uh, PSIDE off the ground. And you can see our, our outcomes are great with a low operative mortality and, and respectable stroke rates. 
and even pretty good survival in these patients. And then on New Year's Eve on 2020, uh, I got this nice letter from the FDA that says our application was approved and we were approved for uh, 100 patients in this PSIDE. So we pulled together a team, nurse uh, coordinating team. I've got some uh, internal funding and put together a data safety monitoring board, got IRB approval. I've got 11 in co-investigators within our specialties of both cardioaortic and vascular surgery. And we enrolled our first patient, uh, 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 I'm sorry, this should say May 27, 2021. So we enrolled our patient, first patient um, almost a year ago. We've now done over 100 of these operations. Actually, we're up to about 110 of these operations. You can see they're uh, well distributed across the spectrum of acute dissection, aneurysms with or without dissection, and a couple of congenital cases, and these different uh, iterations of the reconstruction. The single anastomosis, single stent version, which we typically will use in acute dissections, we can do faster. Uh, the mean time was 44 minutes. This is just some rough data we just pulled recently. The median is probably a lot lower, around 35 minutes. Uh, and the more complex constructions are a little bit longer. But when we submitted our annual report in December with our first 53 patients, we were able to demonstrate quite good uh, outcomes in <clears throat> a complex group of patients with a low mortality and stroke rate, no spinal cord injuries. Several of these patients have had ex extensions and we're looking to submit for another 100 patients. Simultaneously, we've been developing a device, so we don't have to take these off-the-shelf devices. We have several patents. We've gone through different prototypes of what this device should look like, done some benchtop testing, and even designed some packaging for it, and a handheld delivery system. And then recently, we now have an industry uh, sponsor. What used to be Cryolife and is now Artivion, uh, and those team of engineers were quickly able to get some of our prototypes into their very slick delivery systems. And we've been working through what some newer prototypes look like. Uh, I did animal studies. I had to learn how to do an arch replacement in a sheet. It hadn't really been done before. And you can see a nice fluoroscopic image of one of these uh, in a sheep. The sheep necropsies have recently been done and been successful. And we're gearing up for a first in man study. I learned about how to do PSIDEs from my great friend, Roy Greenberger, who's no longer with us. Innovation's part of our mission here in Cleveland. And one of the things that Roy did was really expand at the end of vascular development of technologies for thoracoabdominal aneurysms. So what started out as a fenestration and a branch into a, a, a vessel abutting the infrarenal aorta grew into a covered branch and then helical branches or combinations of both to develop these kind of devices. And now we see a spectrum of these devices available from several industry partners and a lot of physicians who have PSIDEs to perform these complex operations. Other technology is developed alongside it, like technologies that allow for automated sizing for these custom designed devices and fusion imaging to allow for more accuracy of delivering these branches and reduced exposure to radiation to both the, the operators and the patients. Now we've seen the same kind of technology expanding into the aortic arch and there's several companies, a lot of these different single and double branch devices, we'll see this continue to grow. Um, this is a patient uh, where we've also developed some new techniques. Uh, we didn't have any uh, investigational devices available to this guy, and he was turned down for these investigational studies because he was too high risk. Uh, so we went ahead and developed this uh, kind of technique where we debranched everything off of his left common carotid artery. I put him on partial cardiopulmonary bypass from his axillary to his femoral artery, and we deployed this stent graft uh, across his arch. We were able to do it with this Gore device despite him having a mechanical valve. That's a weird angiogram image where you see no head vessels coming off of the aortic arch, but we had good uh, documented flow into that space. With a long spinal needle, I delivered through his carotid artery. You can see I'm pushing on the stent graft to poke through the wall. We then snared a wire, delivered a balloon and a stent graft, and created an in situ fenestration, in situ reconstruction of this patient's aortic arch with this technique and you can see the angiogram looks really great. And you can see a CT scan reconstruction also looks really great for this guy that had this massive aneurysm that is on home oxygen, been on home oxygen. And I've seen him for uh, a six month follow-up. He looks fantastic. I mentioned earlier, there's this unmet need for these people with type A dissections that get turned down. We studied who these people were and found that most of them weren't prohibitive risk patients like elderly people with late stages of dementia or advanced cancer, 
two thirds of them were just a little too old and frail for the surgeons to be comfortable to take them to the operating room, certainly in this emergency situation when they looked horrible. There's room for new devices. And we've had many situations where we've used these devices in an off-label fashion to treat pseudoaneurysms or treat aortic dissections, even this one on the right after a TAVR procedure. And what we learned from that experience using off-label devices is that there's both patient and procedure-related challenges. The ascending aorta is curved. A straight device also should be curved. And we have to be in incredibly accurate at the sinotubular junction. Like in this patient, who they called me from the uh, uh, um, hybrid suite after doing this TAVR procedure that showed that he had a acute dissection of his, of his ascending aorta. You can see it on the IVUS on the right. So I put a device through his groin and he developed severe AI because we uh, trapped a corner of the TAVR valve. So we had a pump ready to go, but I've done this before where I kind of reposition the device. You can see right here, hold your breath. A little scary to do that. We dragged that device uh, off the valve. You can see the follow-up angiogram shows that uh, the valve is now competent again. There had been a lot of AI there. And then I put another device in. We extended that repair a little further again, but this time I knew where to go to stay away from the valve cusps. So we went ahead and deployed that second device. And fortunately in this guy, we were able to cover his tear, which is a little further along in his aorta and get this nice kind of outcome. You'll see in an angiogram in just a second where we've sealed off the tear and we have really great flow again into his arch and his downstream aorta. We have to appreciate that this zone zero is a complex place. Uh, we showed in our analysis of these uh, uh, mostly off-label procedures, about 70 procedures, that the patients who had treatment in the more distal ascending aorta fared better than those who had disease extending into their aortic root. Like the patient on the top right does better than the patient on the bottom right. However, the one on the bottom right actually did really well, uh, despite all that hardware. Nonetheless, we've gotten, uh, again, help from the industry partners. The Gore team uh, has listened to us and helped develop a device that's site-specific for the ascending aorta, uh, and that's achieved by the stage deployment. So this device can be delivered in the ascending aorta, and you see the model on the right allows us to partially expand the device so you can make some fine-tuned adjustments uh, based on the positioning of this device in the proximal aorta. You can see that on the, on the flore, uh, fluoroscopic images as well. After we get the device partially deployed, we then can turn this dial, which shapes this device. It pulls in the inner curve and takes this straight device and turns it into a curved device. You can see this live happening over here on the bottom left. It's very subtle, but allows us to get very coaxial along that sinotubular junction so we can even cover tears that are close to the aortic root. The, the next phase of deployment of this device uh, is done under rapid pacing where we get the device fully expanded. Uh, but then there's a fourth option after we get this fully expanded to turn this dial on the back a little bit further and pull up that inner curve even a couple millimeters more if we find that that's warranted due to uh, proximity to the left main coronary artery, for example. Here's one of these patients. We also need to learn how to understand the interaction of these devices, not only how to deliver them safely. Uh, we were able to treat this 83-year-old lady that was on dialysis, but really quite robust uh, before she showed up at the acute dissection. Um, and she still had a little flow in the false lumen at one month, but at six months, it completely resorbed and this healed and she had this excellent result and she continued to live for a couple more years after this procedure. We've even seen the team in Brazil uh, combine uh, um, a novel uh, technology with branches for the coronaries and a valve to do an endobentol. This is kind of a one-time event so far, uh, but there's a lot to learn. A lot to learn in this space. What happens when there's AI? Um, you can see in this patient on the right, this was a compassionate use. When the uh, AI, we realized the AI was severe, we enrolled them in the compassionate arm of the study, still deployed the device, covered the tear, and tacked up the commissures and got a more competent aortic valve. We also need to appreciate who is really prohibitive risk, just like that group C we learned about when we were doing TAVR procedures, how to do better imaging so we can do it in an expeditious fashion and understand where the entry tears are exactly. 
what to do with that aorta downstream. We may put branch devices in the arch after we do these ascending stent grafts. What do we do when there's a taver in place? And really maybe the role is gonna change. We've had a couple of these patients who we got through the acute phase with ascending stent grafting, their aorta continued to remodel in a bad way, but the patients looked a hundred times better several months later. And we took them to the operating room and did a real open operation in a safe manner. And those patients did well. So it may prove to be a bridge. It's certainly this technology, uh, both for complex arch branches and ascendings, have changed our treatment paradigm for acute type A dissections, where it's not just A or B operate or send to hospice. We also have realized that we have to follow these patients a lot better. Used to be, you know, we send them off to some rehab and we hope that they're doing okay. Sometimes they showed up on our helicopter pad again with advanced disease. And we said, you know, we have to have better dedicated follow-up with a real team. Dr. Crawford knew a long time ago these patients aren't cured of the disease. As we've gotten all of our specialties to sort of embrace this, this lifelong view, we've seen that it's increased outpatient visits drastically, uh, especially for our cardiology colleagues and our imaging teams. But we, we still see in some of this older data that the outcomes aren't great for patients who have an average age of 50 years old. We need to do better than three year survival of 60%. We've been more aggressive with stent grafting, these uncomplicated type uh, B dissections. Uh, and, and we maybe should be treating some of these type A residual dissections a little bit earlier. We've developed a team approach where we're treating these in the subacute phase. It works better, but we know that if we get to these patients too late, they'll still have, and, and even if we provide endovascular therapy, they'll still have retrograde filling of their false lumen and persistent growth of their aorta. You see that image on the right shows part of the reason why is they may have uh, both uh, retrograde flow and then outflow through some intercostal branches. We've learned that we can address these with some of these novel techniques like plugging the false lumen, embolizing those intercostal branches, using some of the branch thoraco technology we talked about, ballooning these devices to kind of expand them and seal them faster, uh, use of the addition of these uncovered stents across visceral segments to safely um, uh, optimize flow in the true lumen. And we've also learned how to operate on them when all those things fail. Uh, and now we see that uh, about half of the thoracoabdominal repairs we do every year is in a patient who's had a previous T-VAR. We can do that safely. We know how to make that happen. And we've even developed a new graft like the one you see on the right that's gonna allow us to do that where we can sew uh, cuff into a large stent graft and the, and the branches down into a smaller infrarenal aorta. Um, our outcomes are pretty decent in these patients where we've operated for thoracal abdominals after previous T-VAR, but very extensive coverage. So the paralysis rate is a little bit higher, but they do quite well. And this, you know, is like uh, uh, an, an example of how we have to have these comprehensive lifelong approaches for these patients. This 60 year old had an emergency type A dissection then came back, we did one of these Thoraflex devices in the patient, then extended it with a T-bar to get that thoracic aorta sealed off. Uh, later on, we saw that the thoracal abdominal expanded. One year later, we brought it back and did a thoracal abdominal extension reconstruction. You can see we sort of cuffed to the large stent graft, brought this down to the inferior aorta. Uh, but we also realized that the iliac arteries dilated. And another six months later, one of my colleagues from vascular surgery put a multi-branch graft into the pelvis. And so we we're able to achieve this kind of complete repair for our patients with this lifelong approach. So in the chronic distal dissection phase, we have all these options available to us. We have to tailor it to the patients over time and provide them with comprehensive lifelong care, certainly expeditious in the acute phase. We're seeing more survivors need more late therapy, especially after aortic dissections. They do better with earlier proactive treatment and we have to understand exactly what that timing will mean. We know that these endovascular technologies are safe and expand our treatment options and that they're complementary to open repair and we have to tailor that decision making as well. We will see better devices and a better understanding of the natural history and etiology of this disease, which will allow us to treat these patients better over a lifetime. How will we be treating the aorta in the near future? Definitely collaboratively and definitely more precisely. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I hope we have some time for questions. And I hope you can join us in Cleveland next fall or join us online for our educational events and tall round events that we run regularly here. I'll stop sharing my slides.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Erica. That was truly a, an incredible, uh, incredibly comprehensive tour of the aortic pathology. This is basically a one-person symposium uh, in an hour here. But there's so much to so much to address, and I'm, I'm sure there are tons of questions. Uh, uh, we'll open up the chat, and I, I think there's also a mechanism to manage uh, uh, participants from uh, verbally asking questions as well. Um, so. Thank you, Eric. Great talk. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you. So, um, Kevin, uh, Dr. LaChapelle, uh, do you have any question for uh, Dr. Roselli? Well, uh, like you said, Renzo, what a tour de force. Uh, Eric, you've been involved in, in this uh, from the tissue level to the, um, you know, from one end of the aortic valve to the other end of, to the iliac. So, I mean, it, it's quite an accomplishment. I, I do have a, I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to take the floor too much. I just, one of the things we do also, we work a lot in, a, in an aortic clinic and we follow patients and we get tissue and we do biomechanics. But one thing we've been learning is that the, you know, the, the pathology of the aorta, certainly of the ascending aorta is quite diverse and uh, it's always grab bagged a cystic medial necrosis. It's a very poor term. It really doesn't reflect the, the heterogeneity that we have, you know, from a Marfan's patient to an 85 year old patient with uh, an ascending aortic aneurysm. And I guess at that level, that, that's where the, the, the abnormalities in the biomechanics lie. It's, it has to be in the tissue. So I just wanted to know your thoughts about how do we get better understanding of what's going on at the tissue level and maybe at the molecular level to, to understand why a patient would rupture versus a patient dissect and why a patient has a, a significant stiffness, whereas a patient who's Marfan, actually the order is not that stiff. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, a really important question, and and um, part of the reason why we sort of designed this Matadors protocol to be sort of broad in the kind of data that we gather from these specimens. Um, I just showed you, you know, a couple of things that that we've that we've sort of demonstrated, and they're just scratching the surface in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now is um, as we've gathered, you know, a ton of slides, histology slides. Um, and been able to consistently characterize uh, the, the accumulation of proteoglycans in those spaces, uh, degradation of elastin fibers. We're working on trying to um, objectively quantify that. And so we've got some software that allows us to use, um, you know, uh, uh, color pixelation quantification to sort of describe some of what we're seeing on those histology slides. So we have some objective data and we, we know that the specimens that we're looking at from those slides are next to the specimens that we've been doing the biomechanics upon. Um, and so maybe we'll, we'll figure some of that out. The tricky part has been, you know, for example, looking at elastin degradation, it's more than just counting how much elastin is there. It's trying to understand what's happening in this disorder and this breakup. So um, one of the things we're going to have to develop is a machine learning technique to sort of describe that, that disorder. If you look at the pathology literature, their grading systems are totally subjective and they have this kind of broad range of very descriptive sort of terms, not the kind of stuff that's easily quantifiable or, or evaluatable with statistical techniques. Similarly, um, and, and sort of parallel to what we're doing with this, with the tissue biomechanics study, is an imaging study. We, um, uh, I bought a, a bicycle that fits onto an MRI machine. It's all graphite. So that um, we'll plan to sort of dual enroll some of these patients where they'll get an MRI pre-op with and without exercise, which is kind of cool. In fact, I volunteered to be a control. I, I hope my aorta is normal, you know. <laughs> um, and we'll use that 4D kind of quantification of flow and wall stress to guide where we get our specimens from in the operating room when we do the biomechanics and assess the histology. And so I think that way we can correlate sort of these different pathologies with what we're seeing at that microscopic level, and then also kind of bring it back to what we're seeing in imaging uh, so that maybe we can identify a patient who has a certain kind of, you know, hot spot in their aorta that's most vulnerable 
with regards to kind of the behavior and tissue mechanics to help guide us in the decision making so we can be more precise. You know, the young patients, we probably do take some of them to the operating room too early, but why take a risk in someone who's going to live a really long time when you can operate on them safely? It's the older patient where you kind of wonder, really, should we be operating on this or not, where it'd be nice to have uh, some, some data. Um, or in the young patient, for that matter, where we think we're definitely going to have to replace the valve, uh, cer certainly would be nice to hold off a little longer and feel confident about that decision. So I, I think we, we can move on from that. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Uh, is Dr. McKenzie, uh, Kent, you have a question for Dr. Roselli? I, I think I saw it on the chat. There was a question from uh, from from Dr. McKenzie about um, uh, at the clinic in the context of the aortic institute. Do all the cardiac surgeons participate, or do you have a select team of specialized aortic surgeons who do the majority of aortic reconstructions and acute aortic syndromes? Um, you know, we've got eighteen adult cardiac surgeons here, uh, so you know, huge, huge volume of work to be done. We also are doing 100 LVADs, 60 transplants, and, and then we have a whole lung transplant service, something like 140 lung transplants or 120 to 140 lung transplants. So um, we have uh, three different call schedules for adult cardiac surgery. One is lung transplant, one is heart transplant, mechanical circulatory support, and then we've got eight surgeons who take adult cardiac call, <clears throat> which is you know occasionally a ruptured papillary muscle, but most often an aortic emergency. Um, all of those surgeons will do an acute aortic syndrome case. The majority of them will do an extended repair like I showed you with that be safer technique. About 90% um, of our Debehi type ones are being done that way. However, um, when it comes to the more complex reconstructions like a chronic dissection needs a redo arch, we've got three or, three or four surgeons who kind of focus on those really complex aorta operations. Eric, if I may, um, uh, you know, you, I'm sure, I'm sure at Cleveland Clinic you have a very large catchment area uh, with your network and your your organization to capture the aortic pathologies. How do you manage the long term follow up? As you mentioned a couple of times, I think we all agree that follow up is, is crucial in these patients. Do you delegate that mm -hmm. follow up? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. So um, when I first started out uh, as a young, you know, young surgeon here, and Bruce Lytle says he hired me, he said he needed some help with aortic service. Um, first thing I thought was, well, I got to get some endo training. And, uh, and I learned from Roy Greenberg when he had these complex patients, a lot of times coming from long ways for these branch endographs. And when he said they had to come back for, for imaging, they did. At least the majority of them did. And then I also realized that a lot of these patients that are flying in were our type A dissection survivors who didn't get good follow-up out in the community because people just don't understand the aorta very well. Not, not that the doctors didn't want to take care of it. They just didn't know how. And so we reached out to all of these type A dissection survivors and invited them back for, uh, for an evaluation. And, and many of them really did. I mean, you know, we had a couple of people that's, what are you trying to round up business or a <laughs> couple of people that, um, had informed us that a patient had died, even though we had combed the social security death index. So I don't, you know, I don't know what they were doing with social, their social security still. Um, but then we realized that a lot of these patients were thrilled for us to reach out to them and come back because, um, uh, because they had aortic disease and their team at home, you know, wasn't really totally up to speed on it. And so over the years, uh, as we operate on these patients, we tell them up front, we plan on having you come back here and working with your doctors at home. And I would say that our compliance with follow-up, even patients coming from a long way, is pretty darn good. It's probably at least 70%. It's not, it's not a 90 or 100, but uh, considering more than half of our patients are traveling more than 200 miles to us for surgery, um, to have like at least three quarters <clears throat> getting regular follow-up with us is pretty darn good. Great. We Thank set you. that expectation up front, I guess, is the simple answer. Good. We have Dr. Felix Ma that uh, uh, has a question. Hi, Dr. Rosali. Thanks so much for your nice talk. 
the question is in regards to the treatments of acute type A dissection. To expand on the usual classic uh, hemi-arch uh, repair uh, in a place where you don't have any uh, uh, thoracic graft or, uh, or you don't have any uh, AMDS uh, stent, um, to set the stage for, to minimize the risk of downstream uh, aortic issue, does it make any sense to do any, say like partial debranching, at least to the anominate, like a zone one uh, anastomosis, uh, and then with the you know, prospects of doing uh, TVAR, uh, completion TVAR down the road is a, is a problem. And with the emerging nexus uh, branch graph and all that, you know. Sure, sure. I think that's totally reasonable. I, I, you know, I think all this technology that we're seeing, we're, we're going to get that AMDS in trial here uh, soon. Um, we'll have the Thoraflex on the device in a little, uh, device on the shelves in a little while. Um, the technique we've developed is one that we've embraced pretty readily across the across the board. I've got 11 different surgeons, you know, doing those operations. Um, uh, and I know that, you know, Joe Bavaria talks a lot about sort of this, you know, zone two sort of reconstruction for acute dissections. Uh, I think all of those are fine, depending on your comfort level. The key is you got to get the patient out of the operating room safely. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, and you want to kind of keep the anastomosis proximal. So, I don't think we'll be using a lot of thoraflexes in acute dissections. It's just too big a complex kind of reconstruction if you're going to use it in zone three with all those branches. Yeah. But if you can trim it somehow um, and get the get the anastomosis more proximal, keep the circa rest times, you know, in that sort of 40 minute or less sort of zone, mm -hmm. we'll still see uh, very reasonable neurologic outcomes. And interesting, in, um, in an internal analysis of our experience before the PSIDE uh, got rolling, uh, I haven't published it because I don't want to publish it until I got the PSIDE rolling. Um, we looked at our extended versus limited repairs. And with the, with our technique of frozen elephant trunk, the acute outcomes are the same as the limited reconstructions, the limited heavy arch reconstructions. There's a trend towards in, improving survival over about five years of follow-up. Mm -hmm. And which really threw me off at first, however, was there were more re-operations in those extended repairs. You know, you think, oh, you're going to get downstream remodeling. No, um, you don't always because there's tears downstream and they're really complicated. The cool thing is, is we were able to do reoperations really easily because it facilitated a second stage endovascular operation mm -hmm. in, in a you know, subset of these patients who had rapid growth of their proximal descending or you know, mid descending aorta in a short period of time. Whereas maybe if we saw that patient with rapid growth within a you know, couple of months after some big open operation, they weren't candidates for a redo arch. Now we're doing them. So, so it facilitates sort of more definitive therapy to that aorta. And it seems to be, that's probably why we see improving survival in that subject. Second question is in regards to uh, intraoperative uh, monitoring, uh, cer uh, cerebral uh, saturation with the nears. Uh, uh, or uh, TCD, do you see that additional uh, transcranial Doppler adds to the cerebral uh, monitoring? We haven't done any TCD. It's just too hard to coordinate, kind of too expensive. And we already have like a lot of complex things going on. Um, okay. We do use um, uh, NIRS. Uh, and most of the time, it's just reassurance that our perfusion is going well. Um, every once in a while, we do switch. Uh, you know, we do switch our perfusion strategy. Um, you might have high resistance in an axillary artery after you reconstruct things in the arch. Um, and that'll, that'll be demonstrated both to higher resistance to the perfusionist and also changes in the nerves. And so we can switch a cannula to a central cannula pretty quickly. Uh, and I, help, I think that helps to guide us and makes a difference. We also um, use a BIS monitor, you know, not the full EEG uh, tracking, but a BIS monitor give us a sense of when we're cool enough in the head and it's nice to see that kind of recover afterward. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, appreciating that the, that the head is a kind of a closed circuit uh, is an important sort of element of that brain protection during those operations. One, uh, one last question, uh, perhaps to Dr. Crystal Trevenkov. Um, Eric, I truly enjoyed your presentation. There's so many questions that come to come to mind, but Renzo, if I can share my screen, they say a picture that is worth a thousand words. I just want to show something. Cool. 
cool. Um, can you can you see that picture? Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the things that come with being in the same center for thirty five years is sometimes the pleasure to see my old patients that operate as neonates 20, 30 years later. But at the same token, I have to face my own long-term complications or problems. So this is a 20-year-old 20, 20 that I did a Norwood procedure, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. You can see the small ascending aorta. This is the new aorta. It used to be a pulmonary, a proximal pulmonary artery. Right. The pulmonary valve, so new, new aortic valve, there's the arch. So this aneurysm or this dilatation is about 65 millimeters or 6.5 centimeters. And right here, it's about 40, 42. Yeah. This is a patient that has a very good fontan, uh, really doing absolutely great, no symptoms, a minimal new aortic valve regurgitation. So the question is, what do we do with this patient? So can we extrapolate from the data from normal hearts and normal aortas to the congenital heart disease situation. Half of this here is a pulmonary homograph patch. Right. Uh, the same thing applies, the same question applies to patients with pulmonary, petrology pulmonary attrition that start with very big aortas. What are we to do with these patients as they go through the adult life? Yeah, un un unfortunately, I think that, you know, their vascular tissue is going to behave the same way as it does in all these other pathologies. You know, like one of the things I talk about is aortic aneurysm and aortic dissection are not diseases. They're late complications of a whole bunch of different etiologies that just kind of funnel into this, this late sequelae, you know? And so we, uh, we see the size is impressive, but what it really means with the behavior uh, is not so easy to correlate. I suspect if we, you know, were to biopsy the native tissue here, we'd see some of the same sort of degenerative things we've seen in these other kinds of aneurysm processes. And so um, hopefully, you know, we'll have some better imaging that allows us to understand what the stiffness of these vessel walls is like and how it's behaves to guide that decision making for you. Cause you hate to reoperate on a Fontan patient who's actually doing well, especially my goodness, you know, I get that. Um, I have had, uh, you know, um, a, a couple of congenital patients, one Norwood in particular that actually, um, you know, ruptured his arch and someone fixed it, patched it. And then the native tissue continued to expand. We had to take all that out. And, and I've operated a lot more, way more sort of co-arts that had, you know, patch reconstructions. The patch turns into this kind of scarred in calcified thing. And I suspect the homograph patch will act the same as a pericardial patch and, 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 you know, I reoperate a lot of homographs. It's kind of this nasty stuff. It's the native tissue that it's sewn to that sort of expands over time. And so um, I suspect we'll see a lot more patients like the one you showed there. That is a really great image. I love it. If you could share it with me, by the way. Um, and um, you know, it's sort of like this question where you correlate size. Well, is it that overall size? It's not really a circle. You know, yeah. the, I think that four, me, four centimeter size is probably going to be more predictive of what happens to that tissue. Um, uh, how often are you imaging that guy? Well, unfortunately, we don't have any previous imaging to see a rate of change. Yeah. Uh, I showed, I sent this picture to Duke Cameron. I think he showed it at the ATS a few days ago. And uh, the consensus is, or at least some of the opinions is maybe it should be operated to prevent a, a, a rupture or, you know. Yeah, I, I uh, spoke at the congenital uh, symposium at ATS and I was asked this question, you know, I was given this assignment to should, should congenital surgeons change their paradigm, man, that is like, that's a terrible <laughs> assignment for me and speaking to a group of congenital surgeons about what to do with these complex aortas, you know, it's not my everyday thing. Mostly I see a lot of cohort stuff. Um, but, uh, um, I kind of pulled the audience and I got really a mixed, mixed bag from people. It's five and a half centimeters, six and a half centimeters. But I think most people would say, once you hit that sort of six and a half centimeter, like what you got with this patient, it's probably time to do something. Yeah. What, uh, what percent of you practice? I mean, in Cleveland, uh, obviously we have a congenital program and you have Hani Najim now, and the, you guys have 
hired uh, Justin Treader from Cincinnati, who's a pediatric cardiologist, to help with the aorta. Uh, are you building sort of a, a team to deal with these adult congenital patients? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's been really fantastic. And Hani is a really wonderful guy, um, great collaborative sort of uh, a, a spirit within our group. And he is part of our group. He's not in the Pediatric Institute. He's in the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute. Um, and uh, 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 we've, we've collaborated on several patients. Um, most of them have been sort of these young Louis Dietz patients. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I've operated on several of them where uh, we've even done kind of the, the hybrid sort of stent reconstruction in the arch. Um, haven't done a patient like the one you showed yet. Um, but I, I suspect we will, we have a, a pretty, pretty busy sort of failing Fontan sort of practice. Um, we're, we're working on it and we're, we're working on sort of getting some of the specimens from the pulmonary arteries, uh, from a lot of our congenital cases over to my lab. So we can do some of the same sort of analyses of those tissues. Um, I, I think we've got an opportunity to learn a lot since, since we're, um, you know, we really have this good partnership between our adult group and our, our congenital group. And we see a lot of patients with, um, you know, hereditary aortic conditions. Anyways, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to seeing you in Montreal next year. Oh, I love Montreal. I can't wait to visit you guys live. Thanks for this opportunity. It's been really nice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roselli. It's very difficult to end this amazing discussion. Uh, this is clearly a subject that uh, has a lot of passionate uh, practitioners behind it. Um, I want to thank the participants uh, for making this actually quite a, an extremely memorable uh, Steichman uh, visiting professor lecture. Uh, we, certainly look, we certainly look forward to a part two uh, in 12 months, um, and we'll be in touch uh, on that note, uh, Eric. Um, so once again, I want to wish everybody uh, a great day. Uh, thanks again for your uh, participation. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Eric Roselli. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the Steichman family as well. Appreciate it. See you soon.